Welcome to the BK Petcast. I'm Bryce. I'm Kenzie. And we're the creators of the BK Pets. Our goal is to help you enrich and extend the lives of your dogs and cats today. And today we're joined by Renee of R Plus Dogs. Renee is a renowned applied animal behaviorist at R Plus Dogs, whose goal is to provide effective and kind evidence-based coaching and guidance to dog guardians around the world. She has a master's in animal welfare science, ethics, and law, a bachelor's in animal management and behavior, as well as a bachelor's level advanced diploma in canine psychology. She also holds multiple certifications in behavior, training, and welfare, including being a fear-free certified professional. And she specializes in offering virtual therapy for fearful dogs, especially dogs experiencing aggression, reactivity, and phobias. Renee, thank you so much for being on today. That was quite a mouthful, which just <laughs> leads into as how, how many qualifications you have. So it's very impressive, but we appreciate you joining you. us. <laughs> It's always weird hearing about yourself because you're like, yeah, I, I, I did that. That, that you know. <laughs> I, was I, think, I think I have a problem. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I wonder if she's just like, yep, yep, yep. I know, and yep. I'm always afraid they're going to be like, ah, no, 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 that part's not right. And I'm going to be like, crap, but I'm, I'm, I think I got it right. So no, that was um, perfect. Yeah. yeah, so again, thank you so much for being on today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, who you are, what you do, all that kind of stuff. So as you said, I'm an applied animal behaviorist. I got that title when I finished my master's. Before that, I considered myself to be a behavior consultant because I have um, over a level six qualification in animal behavior. Well, essentially two. Um, one is the level of and then a um, bachelor's. Um, and then Fear Free Certified. I'm also a family dog mediator um, and a couple of other certifications <laughs> to add to the list, um, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, but I offer virtual consultation and it's, I say that it's for the dog. So it kind of gets conflated as, um, dog training, I suppose. But really what I do is coaching dog guardians to understand their dogs. Um, and I like to say that, you know, behavior modification is the last tier. So we look at everything holistically to do with the dog and make sure that we are, um, taking all those boxes essentially so that when it gets down to the behavior modification, instead of going, you know, right in and say, right, okay, let's start, you know, changing behaviors or looking to change behaviors or, you know, traditional kind of training, I look at everything else first and go, okay, when the dust settles, what are we left with? What are the things that we need to modify? A lot of times it's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, you know, dog guardians will message me and say, I'm really sorry I'm asking you, you know, maybe silly questions or too many questions. And I'm like, no, use me. That's what I'm here for, that private coaching aspect. Um, and I love what I do. I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, and in a virtual format, you know, that really helps me be accessible to people who need me instead of just locally. Um, it's also honed my skills with people, with humans. Um, I was definitely one of those people who would say, you know, I'm a dog lover and I love dogs and, you know, down with and I people. teach humans <laughs> for a living. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas now I really feel like I love working with people. I, I would caveat that by saying I love with, I love working with dog guardians who, who want to better their dogs or even dog guardians who are confused. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there and, you know, it can be such a, like mountain of information that is overwhelming for people. So um, I never hold anything against people when they come to me and maybe they have misunderstandings or they've done things in the past that, you know, they thought were the right things. Um, I would say overwhelmingly, most of my clients are, are down that kind of route anyway, but it's such a rewarding experience to be able to help them grow as dog guardians to learn what I know so that they can go on and, you know, not only with the dog that they have currently, but future dogs and, and also helping family members and things like that. So um, I'm incredibly, incredibly, you know, grateful for what I'm able to do. And um, yeah, like I said, I can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, totally. That's very cool. And I love what you said about, you know, it's, it's not so much about training the dogs because, you know, you can have a dog come to you, let's say you do a board and train for four, six weeks, whatever. That dog is still spending the majority, the, you know, 95% of their life with their human. So it really, you know, we used to take the, um, like the positive fear-free classes, puppy classes and stuff. And that's exactly what I felt. It's like, I'm not going there for somebody else to tell my dog what to do. I'm going there to learn how to have a better relationship with my dog and, you know, be able to operate more normally in life. 
Well, and I really love what you had to say about not holding anything against pet parents because I know for a fact, like, we hold a lot of shame for some of the things that we had done before we knew. Like, we've talked about it a lot on this podcast, like dog parks and uh, socialization and, like, getting them fixed at a certain age and whatnot. And so it's just, like, that is a barrier for me to finding somebody to help us or teach us how to train them is yeah. because I'm like, I'm not a bad person. I just didn't know. Right. And so I think exactly. that's one thing that we really appreciate about what you had to say. And that's one thing we try to bring to our community. Yeah. And that absolutely resonates through your content. You know, I think you're somebody that really, you know, tries to meet people where they're at and is not trying to push some agenda on them. It's just saying, okay, here's where you're at. Let's get you to where you want to be at, you know, and, yeah. and through these methods that, involve treating animals more humanely. And, you know, I always think of it as treating them more like humans and just looking at them as kind of children that you have to, you know, gently parent and, and do a lot of methodical things to get that life you want. So definitely commend you for the, the style in which you teach. But also, you know, I will say to clients all the time and share anecdotal stories of what I've experienced. I made mistakes too. Granted, my mistakes may not have been as um, you know, as invasive or as maybe pronounced as, as the mistakes that they might have made with their dogs. But we make mistakes, you know, it's, it's not something, and especially me, I know very, very clearly what the information is that's out there. So when a client goes, well, I didn't know, or, you know, I thought this was the best. And it's like, I don't blame you because it's yeah. such, it's such a like mind blowing experience. And you just don't know where to go for information. So yeah, yeah it's, oh, Zen deep breath. It's 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 hard. It really, really it is. is. It is. Yeah. Well, and totally two, just is. to piggyback off of that, like, I mean, there are some show like conventional TV shows. I think that maybe have some trainers that are doing things in a more positive reinforcement way. But like, when you think dog trainer, you think oh Caesar Milan. Like that's what was like pushed. You yeah, know, that's what and I so, watched growing up as a kid. Yeah. You know? And you so think, you think that. You know, I don't know what channel he was on, but like you think that this these TV shows wouldn't possibly spread information. Like this has got to be the truth, and you mm -hmm. come to find out, it's just it can be quite the opposite in many different instances. Everything I ever knew was a lie. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you grow up and learn that everything is kind of bullshit, and you have to relearn so yeah. much. Yes. Yeah, and it's hard for people yes. to be able to do that as well. Like I, you know, my husband will say to me often, you know, people. <laughs> You can't look at people like you, you know, expect people to kind of look at things like you would. Because if somebody turned around and said, you know, I have this evidence and, you know, here's the paper and, you know, this is what we have as, as research in that, I'd be like, hmm, okay. You know, yeah. I'm open to changing my mind. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, that's not normal for humans. We really want to hold on to what we believe. And, you know, we don't want to think that we're harming our dogs or doing anything negative to them. No. And so... It can be a really emotional experience. I would say most clients <laughs> end up crying in their first like assessment with me. I'm and they're sure. like, so sorry. I'm like, you don't even know how many people have cried. You know, I've cried with people <laughs> because it is, it's a really, you know, and once you realize that maybe you've been doing things quote unquote wrong, or, you know, you've been given that misinformation and you've been practicing that nobody wants that for their dog. Right. And the, the thing that comes down to, too, is like the misinformation, you know, obviously we're big in the world of nutrition and like trying to push people to a more fresh diet and stuff. And it's like big kibble and, and that kind of information that we don't agree with has been marketed so well. I mean, they are absolute geniuses when it comes to marketing. And I'm sure that bleeds into the training industry as well. It's like regardless of what information these people have dollars to back them, they can push these TV shows and commercials and all these different methods that like you're talking about, you know, the science is starting to prove that they're probably not as effective. Yeah. Yeah. And diet is something that I do discuss in, in my assessment, sometimes to a great extent, depending on the situation. And we will look at, you know, whatever diet that they're on and I'll look at the ingredients and I'll work that out with them. And I'll say, you know, they'll feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I thought this was a really good food. And that's exactly what I say to them is, you know, I look at the packaging to them and I'm like, look at this, we have blueberries, we have carrots, mm -hmm. we have blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm telling you, you know, there's less than 1% in there. And they're like, oh my gosh. But, yeah. you know, and even meat, meat is the huge thing. And I don't want to yes. deter too much into the diet thing because I, again, could talk about that for a while. But, <laughs> you know, meat and then it's a big piece of meat and it's green and it's healthy. And then you look on the back and it's like 30 percent meat. Right. And they're like, oh, or I don't meal. understand. Yeah. Yep. And meat, yeah, all 
Totally. And it's like yesterday when we went to Costco and my mom called me and she goes, she was, this is not obviously to do with the pet industry, but she was like, I had been telling her about her washing machine and like, you know, using too much detergent and how they're kind of lying to you about how much you need to use. And she was like, I literally just saw this TikTok by this uh, home maintenance person that said the same exact thing. And it's like, yeah, they're, they're selling you things and doing things to try and push their agenda. So it's so hard. But like, as we're starting to learn about this, we have to keep a closer eye out on these things because we can be so easily convinced of one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a lot of um, my dissertation was actually on welfare washing, but in the pet dog industry and looking at training specifically. But I think there's even that, you know, that kind of nutritional washing, if we will, um, when we look at diet. So um, I have like resources. You guys are one of the resources that I hand to clients to say these are. Yeah, exactly. Because like it's so hard to get correct information and sometimes with with food you're like it makes sense to feed fresh but you've been indoctrinated with all this information you know that says that your dog should have this brown kibble and that's nutritionally complete and I admit to clients that I once was that person it was you know a be a very good kibble but I was completely kind of conformed to the fact that I was feeding my dog a nutritionally balanced complete you know meal and with my husband he, I remember him saying, because Nero's always been like supplemented with raw and we were sitting at dinner and we were talking about Nero and his eating. And, you know, I was like, he doesn't eat a lot and I'm not sure he likes his food. And, you know, my husband was like, why don't you just feed him, you know, raw? You can do that. And I was like, oh, but I don't know. I don't want to switch. You know, this is a really good, like cold press, nutritionally complete food. And he just went, you love science. Why don't you go and find some some research on feeding raw and see? Um, and I did. Um, and then we switched him to raw. So he's been on a complete, you know, full kind of raw diet for about six, seven years now. And he loves it. Like the yeah. change in him, everything, you know, again, it's anecdotal. But I was one of those people. And again, you know, like I said just a couple minutes ago, I am open to changing my mind if, if things, you know, do go that direction. But mm-hmm. I was definitely that person who was like, absolutely not. I have done all the research. And um, my husband was right. You know, <laughs> there was more out there and I just needed to find it. And it's so interesting. You know, we talk to a lot of people that kind of have this aha moment and it's always different for every person. You know, for us, it was like I was listening to a podcast by Karen Becker and that was kind of like, what are we doing? But It's, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, oh, you know, I'm starting to stay on the outskirts of grocery stores and not shop the aisles and try to, you know, ditch the processed food. And it's like, okay, you you know that, you think about that, it applies the exact same to dogs. So I think that avenue is a big aha moment for a lot of people. But I love, you know, just I can get the vibe from you that you feel the same way we do. And it's like, we're not here to be right. We're here to get Mm -hmm. it right. So that means if something we say turns out to be wrong, we'll let you know. We'll we're like, we're in search of the truth for this information. And like we talked about earlier, we're not here to push an agenda. We're here to find the latest science backed stuff to help your dogs and cats live the longest, healthiest life possible. So yeah. I love that. Take it or leave you know. it, you know? Like exactly. it's there for you. Yes. And yeah, so that's why I love your you know, your guys' account as well because it is very much like that. Instead of pushing, you know, an agenda, it is just like, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And, you know, it's always funny. I get a lot of um, trolls and things like that who push against, <laughs> you know, the the way that I train. And I'm just like, that's cool. If you want to train your dog like that, or you want to, you know, live with your dog like that, there's a better way. Right. I'm trying to help you. Um, you know, I do like, sometimes I do unpopular opinions and those are always great. Cause it's oh, just like gosh. my ideas based on, you know, not only my experience, but it's also my education and, you know, my, my own dogs come into play with that and observations of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of clients now you know I don't just pick this stuff out of the air so Mm -hmm. you know it's it's things like that where it's like these are just you know you might my musings if we will um if it helps your dog great if you if you don't like it then this is social media you can keep on scrolling right Mm -hmm. it's always the best interest of of the dog (laughs) of course absolutely absolutely it reminds me a lot of when we talked to Dr. Billinghurst and he was like talking about the evidence he saw when he was feeding his dogs raw in the very beginning. And people were like, where's the science? He's like, I like, 
I am a doctor. <clears throat> I believe in science. Of like 30 or 40 <clears throat> years. But he's like, I don't need science because I'm literally seeing the changes yeah. right in front of me. Well, and it's like you said, Renee, it's like yours is anecdotal. And it's like, okay, when does the anecdotal evidence of probably millions of pet parents become actual evidence for, you know, the benefits of whatever we're talking about. And so it's like, you know, you know, especially in our nutrition world, people always say, you don't have the science. There's no science backing. Raw is better than kibble. And we always say, and I don't, you know, we don't need to get too into kibble here, but I always say, where's the science that says kibble is better than raw? You know, raw has been around for millions of years. It's the natural state of how dogs have lived since they started evolving. And kibble's this hundred year old thing. So, yeah, I, I don't want to get too into that because I'm going to get a little fired up here soon. And <laughs> yeah, we're 15 we minutes in and haven't even gotten to our two. first question yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely doing a part two. That is absolutely going to be coming soon. So, but also, and I just want to comment just one little, little, little bit of that. It's like you don't have to make the full commitment to raw. Like you know, I have clients right. that are vegans and vegetarians, and that stuff makes them uncomfortable. You know, even feeding just a little bit more fresh, or if you want to home exactly. cook, as long as you're doing it in a nutritionally sound way that's cool. You know, mm -hmm. like there's no reason for you to just go, well, is it raw or kibble? And I don't have any options in between. There's lots right, of yes. options in between, lots of wiggle room. And I think yeah, that and on the, people. it totally does. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's the raw purists, you know, the ones that say, if you can't feed raw, you don't deserve to have a dog. And it's like, no, like there are so many situations that go into what a person is able to feed their dog from finances and how they grew up and accessibility and what stores they have access to that it's like we like what we talked about earlier. We have to meet people where they're at and teach them how to make improvements based on what is manageable for them, because otherwise they're they're, they're not going to make improvements if they you know, if they're overwhelmed by the making the full switch to raw, they are not going to make the switch to raw and they're going to just eat kibble or we could give them tips on how to add things to their kibble. And now they're feeding kibble with some fresh food and involved as well so yeah that's interesting yeah <laughs> i want to keep talking about that uh <laughs> i know it that's the next podcast it sounds like <laughs> so how did you personally get into dog training well i've always loved animals like animals in general um even from me I, so my like family and friends they often joke that I started loving dogs like or becoming obsessed with dogs like in the womb because literally when I came <laughs> out, I was watching like cartoons that had animals in it, you know, reading books, looking at things like uh, some of the earliest memories for me are like watching nature documentaries. My mom would buy me like books on animals and things. Um, so I just think it's just something within me that's just had a strong affinity to animals. And mm -hmm. I also love like the Canadai group. So the like foxes, wolves, um, and then dogs are just a part of that. So I think it's just, I have favorite animals. Like I like other animals besides dogs, but, um, there's just something about them. You know, we, we share our lives with them. We have these really intimate relationships. And like you said, you know, for me, I have a, a saying that I say to all my clients, which is, um, that my dogs are my babies but I still treat them like dogs. Mm. And in the sense of like what a dog's real needs are rather than just mm. like, you know, my dogs can do whatever they want. Obviously within my house, you know, there's my husband and uh, myself, my two dogs and a cat. And so, you know, everybody has a place within that family. Yes, there might be some different rules for like me versus, you know, my older dog Nero, but there's a lot of compromise that comes with that, like any other relationship. Um, they're allowed to do a lot of things that maybe other dogs might not be able to do. And I try to give them as much freedom as possible, but at the end of the day, they're still dogs. Yeah. Um, and so for me, there's always been like a really strong affinity for that. So I got started in a rescue. Um, I had a, uh, high school project, which was to do a, a service for the community. It was part of, um, I can't remember what the the class was called right now, but, um, community service, that makes sense. Oh. So it was a community service project. And I was like, I want to work at the shelter. So I went to the local ASPCA and asked them if I could do this volunteer role. They were elated because anybody who works in rescue knows you need an extra pair of hands, you know, take whatever you can get. Yes. So I was about like 15, you know, 14 ish. And I did that. And it was really high opening for me. Um, I think, you know, we had had dogs growing up and the, the only way that we got rid of the dogs is, you know, 
naturally if they if they passed away. And so mm-hmm. seeing people coming in and, and relinquishing their dogs and, you know, it just got me kind of thinking, how can I help more? I've always been like that. What can I do to do more? Um, and so I left that. I continued volunteering for them. I also did a little stint of working for them, but ultimately it was really emotionally draining for like oh, a teenager. I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. So wow. um I went into I also um, have a background in art, which anybody who follows me on social media loves my content. And I'm like, don't be, you know, don't be intimidated. I did do graphic design for a number of years. So, <laughs> you know, um, but I went and did that. It kind of, you know, pursued art for a little bit. And then I had the opportunity to work at a vet's. And I started out as an assistant and they were doing some certification for um, vet technicians. And I was like, me, like instantly I knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, I became certified for a vet tech. I worked in, in veterinary medicine for about 10 years, but my driving factor was always behavior. And when, you know, I decided to go back to school, everyone was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, ethology, I want to do ethology, which is the study of animal behavior, but distinctly I was, you know, focused on dogs. And so I went back into education and um, there was a little wobble there for a little bit where I thought, you know, I want to do species specific enrichment for zoos. That was like around six, eight months. I was like, I want to, you know, I want to do that for like ungulates. So, you know, like hoved animals. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I'm crazy. Like, what am I? I I love dogs. Like, what am I doing? So I went right back to to dogs. Um, And yeah, I, I got started that way. So really my kind of background is, is like the educational route. Um, Mm -hmm. I started studying a different type of like training, looking for certifications and things like that. And then I didn't feel very confident um, when I first started off. So when I started my business and my husband um, allowed me or, you know, the space and opportunity to do that, I was like, yes, this is what I want to do. But I didn't feel very confident. So I was like, yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll start, you know, pet sitting or um, walking dogs. Nobody wanted me to walk their dog. Everybody was like, do you know anything about this behavior? Do you know anything about this behavior? And so very timidly, I was like, I'll dip my toe into this. And then it just exploded. So for me, where I am locally, I was seeing clients, you know, I was having like 10, 12 hour days, rushed off my feet, you know, four clients in the morning, come home from my own dogs, four clients in the evening. Um, I know it was a lot. And I mean, not to get too much into kind of the mental health side, but there was a large period of time where I was loving what I was doing, but I would be driving home and I would be you know, almost like in a little bit of a panic saying to myself, I need a break. I need a break. I need a break. And I would be booked out three, four weeks in advance. And I'm like, wow. but I can't take a break. And so for me, COVID hitting, we, well, we were talking about going virtual, my husband and I for a while, cause he, he builds my website and he helps me with things digitally. And so I was like, I really want to do virtual, um, COVID hit. And I had to come to a screeching halt for me, it was um, a, a positive. I mean, I know there was a lot of negative going on. And there was negative for me as well, but it was a huge positive because I just said, okay, we have to go virtual or, you know, I didn't even take a break. I wish now looking back, wow. I'm like, why didn't I take that break? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the perfect time to take a break. But I was like, no, yeah. within, I think um, a couple of weeks, we started offering virtual services. And so, you know, the rest is kind of history. Virtual is, I choose now to be virtual. Very rarely will I go and see clients um, in person. I just had a case, which was a a special case, um, which involved um, like police and, you know, rescues and things like that. Um, So that I make exceptions for those kind of situations, but otherwise I'm 100% virtual. Um, That's incredible. yeah, I love it. I love it. The business is growing. It's, it's, you know, I, unfortunately I've been ill since about the beginning of March, which, um, you know, you were aware of, but since then, you know, we've right before then we started to transition the business. So there are really big things coming for the business, um, for the, for the future, but for right now, kind of my main, um, main focus is privately guiding and coaching clients. Um, but there's a lot more to come. Totally. This is just a really quick side note. 
your website is so amazing. So make sure you oh, tell your yeah. husband that <laughs> I was, when I was doing some research, like trying to find information about you for the intro, I was like, Bryce you got to look at this website. And this is coming from a person who spent the last like two or three weeks working with our website editor on our new website. Mm -hmm. So big compliment coming from her. I was like, whoa. So when you said that, please tell him. Very impressed. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. He loves it. I mean, he created my last website and there were so many comments about it. And I was like, yeah. And I'm also, I'm, I'm the worst client ever for him because he's my husband. I can be like, Scott, (laughs) <laughs> Can I this thing? So we're actually changing with the transition of the business. The website's going to change yet again. Um, but yeah, I will, I will definitely tell him. I'm sure he's probably like, you know, PTSD from making this freaking <laughs> website. <laughs> That's great. So first of all, I want to commend you for, you know, you talked about how you were starting to do this dog tra- or not the dog training, but like the dog walking and pet sitting and nobody wanted you to do that. And you, you kind of finally dipped your toe in. That is such a hard thing to do because it's like, I feel like kind of in our bones, at least this was the way with Kenzie and I is like with when you get to a kind of a turning point like that where you have an opportunity to really dive into what you've been wanting to do you know that like life is going to change for the most part you know that things are going to be and not you know this consciously but you kind of like i said i feel like you know it in your dna and so the fact that you were able to take that first step and and be brave and do that is really cool but i wanted to ask you did you find it hard to work in the vet office like you found it hard to work in the shelter for some of the similar reasons? You know what? I, my, so my friends um, had a saying for me growing up, um, which was Jiminy Cricket. All right, Jiminy Cricket. I, I don't know why, but I have this really intense consciousness. So like, I think that's why I've gone for welfare and ethics and things like that. But Um, Working the vets, there were times where I would see things. I always tried to um, use a lot of kindness and, you know, but there were some times when I think with the vets, it's just like we have to get done what we need to get done. And so like if a dog is in and they need something done, we would do it. However, it kind of needed to be done. There were a couple of points in my career where I had to draw the line specifically Um, I don't think my practice manager always loved when I appeared at her her office door, um, because it usually meant that I was going to say that I didn't want to be a part of something or to object, um, you know, cat declaws at the time were legal. Um, there was one time where, you know, we were going to do a four paw declaw and I was confused and I, the client had called up and I said, oh, no, we would not do a, a four-paw declaw. We we would just do two, and then you'd have to come back and, and do the other two if that's what you wanted. Um, and although I'm against declawing in general, you know, this is what the practice did, so I had to explain this to the client. Um, next thing I know, I got called into the office, and I had to call the client back and apologize and say that we were going to do a four-paw declaw. And wow. I, I kind of, you know, kicked up a fuss about that, and I said... If you're going to do that, if you're going to agree to do that with the client, I'm not going to assist in that procedure. So there were things like that that did happen. Granted, these were things that they offered and stuff. But, you know, my ethical kind of line has always been quite strong. So, yeah, there were things that that did happen in veterinary, which looking back, I feel a bit like uneasy about. Sure, I'm um, sure. But also, you know, at the end of the day, it was really about helping the dogs to feel or animal. We had cats. We had small, you know, pocket pets. We even saw exotics for a while um, was helping them to to feel better. There were times where I saw things from other, you know, technicians or other people. And, you know, there there were times where I had to, you know, really just pull them aside and say, you know, that's not that's not OK. Um, but I feel like in veterinary there is, especially now with like the fear free, there is a movement to really help animals feel as comfortable as possible. Um, but my experience is, yeah, I mean, I do kind of look back. Um, I worked at two different hospitals as well. So one hospital was significantly better than the other. I mean, that hospital had like mattresses for the dogs to wake up on and things. Um, 
yeah, and warming blankets and, you know, all these kind of things that um, you would have a, like a normal surgery for, for humans. Um, but I definitely have worked at places um, and thought this isn't, this isn't necessarily for me. And part of the reason why I did leave veterinary is because I couldn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life. And I was really curious about the dog's behavior and why they were acting the way that they were. Um, and again, that kind of mindset of like, what can I do to to help them. So when I first started my business and it was all in person, the first one of the very first things I did was link up with a local veterinary practice to say to them, look, puppy classes, having the puppy classes in the veterinary practice sets dogs up for success. And they loved oh, it. Oh, for like a socialization aspect and like desensitizing too. Yeah. Yeah, wow, I didn't even think we did. About, I started wow. doing adult classes as well for dogs who had um, negative encounters with the vets. And yeah. so doing that counter conditioning and desensitization practice with them, I had a really nice, which <laughs> looking back, some some clients really loved it. I had a Zen class. So the Zen class was where dogs who and I only took two or three dogs at a time. So dogs who already had negative interactions with the vets. And we would do like aromatherapy and calming music and massage and the room was Kidding. nice and like low and muzzle work. And, you know, so, yeah, it, I think that really helped me bridge the gap between those two worlds. And it definitely helps me as a behavior consultant, like yeah. 100% being able to look at like I was talking about with that holistic approach. There's sometimes I work with clients and I'm not happy with the physical element that's going on. I'm, I'm saying to them, there's something, it's a big question mark here. Um, and there have been a lot of times where we haven't even done any behavior work because they come to me, you know, we do an assessment. It's a really deep dive in looking at things. My brain's, you know, going a million miles a minute and I'm connecting all these strings together. And I'm like, there's something missing. Can you get your vet or can you get a second opinion? Or can we have this type of test? Um, and there's been a lot of cases that come back and we don't ever get to doing, we do very mild behavior modification because there's something mentally, I'm sorry, there's something physically going on with that dog that will address the behavior. Or unfortunately, um, we have a situation sometimes where the dog isn't maybe a, in a great physical place and, um, they end up having to be aware that maybe their dog is, very critically ill um, sure. and making decisions that ultimately, you know, is the quality of life going to be good for that dog if they continue living? So it's it's a broad spectrum of things that happen. But having that, that veterinary mind um, definitely helps me with, you know, with that behavior aspect. Absolutely. And one of the reasons I asked was, <clears throat> you know, pretty recently I've had dreams of becoming a vet and I've, I'm going back to school right now to get my undergrad and start that journey. But I've actually uh, decided to go away from vet school and, you know, pursue more of maybe a PhD in animal nutrition. And it comes down to a lot of the things that you talk about with like the shelter and vet offices, you know, you deal with so much abuse and, and euthanization and just, I think, did we say like vet, veterinarians have the third highest suicide rate by profession, yeah. I think, at least in the U.S.? And and it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, you have to – you have this passion and you want to share all this stuff, but you also have to safeguard your mental health. And so it sounds like that was definitely an aspect, you know, at least with the shelter in, in your regard. Well, yeah, and the veterinary as well when you're talking about euthanasias and things like that, um, for me – I would disassociate. So the very first euthanasia I saw was this, because we also did boarding. This dog came in for boarding and very quickly we recognized that this dog was not well. Um, and so the vets had to call the um, guardians and they were away on vacation. And they basically just said, you know, do whatever. Um, and this small little, you know, emaciated, like not well poodle, um, was just sitting there and the doctor asked me if I would assist. And I was like, of course, but this dog was so lethargic. Um, you know, normally assist means like you want to hold or something. So, um, I'm just sitting there kind of, you know, petting the dog. Um, that was my first experience of seeing a euthanasia. And I remember kind of thinking, oh, okay. And then I walked into the x-ray room to go and get something and I just burst out crying. Oh. And I didn't even know why I was crying. I was just like so emotional. And 
a friend kind of came in um, and she was getting something and talking to herself and turned around and saw me and she was like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, I, I don't even know. <laughs> like, I don't even know why I'm crying. It's just, and then I realized like that was the first time that I ever saw something like that. So I would say, unfortunately, I became very desensitized to it. So I was the one that everyone was like, you know, Renee, go in with them. And I would just go in and, you know, sometimes people would want to hug you. Sometimes, you know, it was really emotional for them. Sometimes it wasn't emotional for people. It's really a range of things, you know, and seeing those human experiences um, with the loss of a pet. So that I understand and I've had, you know, previous clients where we've worked for months and months and months. And sometimes, you know, it's been like a year or, or plus that we're working with an animal and then there's nothing else that can be done. And that's so hard to have, you know, on, on a vet shoulder and also, you know, any kind of supporting, um, to say to somebody, I've been in lots of rooms where to, you know, we have to say to somebody, this is bad news or that nothing else can be done. And so I really did become desensitized to it where I would go in and I would go through the motions and I would come out and, I did end up having a lot of um, thoughts about like compassion fatigue. And I think that also contributed to me wanting to leave veterinary med, um, which was me. I'm very much like a, you know, go, go, go. Um, my husband calls me like the Terminator because he's like, da, 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 da. I'm always like, you know, in the zone and I want to do stuff. But also the amount of hours that vets work, I was working, which by choice, I was working, you know, 12 hour shifts, three, four days a week. Um, on my feet the whole entire time, get, if you're lucky, you get 30 minutes for lunch, the doctor will come and find you. And they're like, I need you to help me with this. And I was like, you know, so you may be not even getting your 30 minutes of, of break or, or lunch or, you know, that, that kind of decompression that you need. So yeah, it's a, it's a highly emotional gig. It ha it's very rewarding, but at the same time, I understand why, you know, there is a high suicide rate. Cause it's, yeah. Sometimes it's it's really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Especially working, you know, I think all animals are are innocent, but gosh, like our companion animals are especially our dogs that are always in such great moods and so happy to see us. Like I just can't even imagine. Um, so next question, and we're 37 minutes in and haven't even gotten to the topic <laughs> at hand today. We're talking about enrichment today. So um, if that wasn't all, clear. <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. Can you give a little bit of, you know, a little background as to what enrichment is from your perspective and specifically how it plays into behavior in your industry? Yeah, so and enrichment is an opportunity for like species specific behavior. And that's usually like a mental and physical element. Um, with dogs, it's the saying like allowing dogs to be dogs. So we're looking at innate behaviors, behaviors that are intrinsically linked to dogs. Um, and so to me, enrichment is a behavior because it's fulfilling a need that is there. It's present. You can't just ignore enrichment because if you're not supplying anything for your dog to do, you know, there's a great saying that if you don't supply your dog a job, they will look for a job. They will find a job. They don't want to be unemployed. Um, so <laughs> the other thing that's important to remember, which people don't often consider, is that dogs are captive animals. So we choose everything for them. I like to say, even in my household where, you know, I try to give my dogs as much autonomy as possible, I still dictate a lot of their life. You know, like I had to close the door um, so that my older dog who's in the room with me couldn't stay outside because I didn't want him to bark for the podcast. So I asked him to come in. Of course, he's resting, he's sleeping. So is he bothered? Not that bothered. But at the same time, would he choose to be outside? Yeah, he would. Would he choose to bark at random things? Yeah, he would. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's a compromise, but I don't think people understand just how much we do dictate dogs' lives. Um, time that they eat, they go to the bathroom, bathroom, even so much as what they get to learn, what they get to experience. So enrichment provides that kind of gap in what a dog would like to be doing and what we kind of can work with. So I love to remind clients that, you know, if your dog's cup is empty, your dog is definitely going to look for these behaviors and you may not like how they're going to look for these behaviors. 
we just experienced that. So Banks, I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about Banks and his injuries. Oh, God. He <laughs> has had stitches two times in six weeks and then just ripped a toenail off. And so. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. like, and, and. We're talking like he cut himself rubbing up against a wire fence, and then we think he sliced his paw on, like, the lawn divider between the grass and the rocks out in our backyard. And then he was running in the house and ripped his toenail off. So it's not even like he's doing agility and all this crazy extreme sports. It's like he's living and getting hurt. And this is a side (laughs) note. You never have to, like, apologize or feel like you can't go off on mental health tangents. That's, like our passion yes. so i'm gonna say right now this is the first time i've talked about ifs on this podcast i have a part that is nervous to say that because banks is injured none of our dogs have been getting much exercise yeah. i feel really a lot of shame about that yeah it's okay we're doing the best we can but cooper he's finding jobs <laughs> he's finding jobs in the trash he's finding jobs on the couch and i'm like okay it's time to give this dog a job. Yep. And it's, you know, it just comes down to like, like what we were trying to do the other day, it was kind of rainy and shitty outside. And so we were like, okay, let's play this game where we, the dogs run up and down the stairs and we give them treats and, you know, play around the house. And that's when Banks ripped his toe. So yeah, there are so many things where it's like, you're trying to do all these things you can for your dog. And, and then it seems like the thing you do makes it worse. It's yeah. at times. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Absolutely. Well, you know, so- I can admit to you and I, and I've been sick and I've told, you know, lots of clients this, I have been sick since the beginning of March. Um, we went away for a couple of days and then we both got colds. So yay, thank you, immune system. My dogs within that time, so first of March, you know, that's a couple of months that I was kind of down. And my husband is working and, you know, he's doing things around the house and he's taking care of the dogs. The dogs were not walked more than two times within those two months. So about once a month, my dogs were actually quote unquote walked. There was lots of enrichment activities that were going on, but these were things that I minimally could participate in just because of how ill I was. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when people are like, I gotta, you know, do all these things for my dog or I feel really guilty. It's like, it's normal. Sometimes there's a great quote I love where it's like, you know, if all you did today was survive, that's, that's enough. And so I was definitely in that mindset where like, I am the queen. I love enrichment. You know, I love making my dogs happy. I love watching. I never get tired of watching dogs do enrichment, but I re- in this house, it was very the bare bones minimum, you know, of what we were doing. And the dogs were predominantly great. <clears throat> and, and so and like, Oh, keep going. Renee. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like, you know, if, if pet parents are listening to this, I know pet parents are listening to this. So to the pet parents listening to this, you know, you have three experts on the podcast right now talking to you about the shortcomings of what we're doing with our dogs and how we feel like we're not doing enough. So there is shame and there's hard feelings that come with it. But to all the pet parents out there, please know that we're all doing the best we can at every point in our life. And your dog is happy to be with you. Would it be perfect in a perfect world for them to run for eight hours a day or do all this other stuff? Yeah, absolutely. But like, we we live we a life. Say, Go ahead. You can't save the world if you're depressed. Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> our dogs live this life with us. And sometimes that involves not doing all the things they might want to do because of stuff going on in our own life. And so it happens even to us as experts in this field. It happens to every single person. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, and going off of enrichment. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say. We were talking about enrichment and you know, physical exercise. And one of the things we wrote in our book that's coming out here soon is that imagine all the social things that you do as a human. You know, you go out to dinner with friends, you go out to drinks, movies, you know, watch TV shows, play video games, whatever it may be. Imagine replacing all of that with a two mile run every day and not doing anything more mental and just doing that physical exercise. And you'd be, you'd be lacking things. You'd be missing things in your life. You'd be a freak athlete and be super healthy, of course, but you'd be craving that other stuff. And so I think that's where a lot of people don't realize mental enrichment fills that gap of like taking your dog on a four mile run where they don't get to sniff a bunch of stuff is physically draining, but it's not as mentally stimulating as you probably think. So if you're, you know, especially if you're listening to this right now and you're worried about not being able to exercise your dog as much as possible, 
do the mental enrichment side of it. And we're going to get into more of that, but the mental enrichment, like I just said, can definitely fill that gap. So yeah. going off of that, what are the purposes of mental enrichment? Like what, what does, what does it do for dogs? What are the benefits? Um, so it's great for you to, um, use it just to kind of generally offer those fulfillment, um, mentally and, you know, physically. And I think the other thing that you mentioned about, you know, looking at, um, just that physical aspect is like enrichment can be, a, can have physicality in it. I mean, when we look at sniffing, you know, I have a great video of my dog Nero, who is very whippet like in structure. He's a whippet cross border collie, but, um, you're looking at him sniffing and it's that type of aerobic respiration. So that very quick, you know, aerobic respiration that you would have when a dog is, is running or engaging with that physical activity. Whoa. So when people That's think like think about. sniffing, yeah, people think like, oh, sniffing isn't, how is it tiring? I mean, there is that thing that keeps going around, which I just saw um, on social media actually right before <laughs> our podcast. And I was like, oh, perturbed. But 15 minutes of sniffing is equivalent to like an hour of running. And I'm like, oh, we shouldn't, you know, kind of push that as much because I think it gives the, the wrong impression. 15 minutes of maybe doing sniffing might be, you know, might replace some of that physicality of, of running. But there are, you know, reasons to allow dogs to run and, and stuff like that. There's endorphins and, you know, the great things that happen while they're running. But at the same time, you know, when we look at sniffing and we're looking for that, that type of aerobic respiration, the dog is also moving around. So if we're doing like scavenging, the dog is moving, but they're really focused on finding that food and the brain is working, you know, that olfactory system. If you look at a dog's brain and compare it to a human's, the olfactory bulb in a dog's brain is huge. I mean, in humans, it's teeny, but in wow. dogs, it's massive. So paying attention to those types of exercises generally are going to be the most beneficial for your dog. But at the same time, there is physicality involved with that. So Absolutely. it's mental and it's physical. Um, and I think people kind of look at it as two separate entities. And I definitely say to clients, you know, if you're going to do, um, I have something called a cool down cap. So what that is, or sandwiching, and I'll say a cool down cap is where we've done some physically intense activity. Like we might say tug, we play tug for like 10, 15 minutes. Um, I'm, you know, I don't think dogs need to play tug for like maybe longer than that. And some dogs may pay, play tug for like five minutes, but if we have that physical and that's purely physical, some mental, depending on how you construct it, you want a cool down cap. So for arousal, you want to be able to get your dog high without arousal and then cool them down. So for me, that's the trifecta of calm, sniffing, licking, or chewing, and having the dog lower that arousal level. So when people say like, oh, my dog is crazy, you know, he won't stop. Um, a, one of the myths about enrichment is that you have to keep your dog physically stimulated, you know, lots and lots of enrichment so they don't get bored. No, two to three times, you know, my dogs, sometimes I tell clients, my dogs eat out of bowls, you know, yeah. that whole ditch the bowl kind of thing. They eat out of bowls in the, in the evening. They have every, pretty much every single meal that they have in the evening is a bowl feed meal because A, it's raw and B, they've done other things during the day. So I don't need right. to worry about having them mentally fulfilled. Um, the other thing I would say is it does reduce stress. So, you know, getting them mentally stimulated we're looking for those species specific behaviors. So even things like digging or, um, you know, working for tug or even sometimes fetch if it's constructed of, of more of like a find it. We don't want to again, go too much into kind of that repetitive fetch, 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 really bad for the dog mentally, physically. Um, but if we can kind of construct things with the dog and think more kind of methodically about what are we, what are we asking and how might this look like? for a dog who's like maybe, maybe a street dog or a dog who has the ability to have a lot of autonomy. When we look at those dogs, those dogs aren't running around. They're not racing around. Most of the time they're sleeping. When they are walking, they're walking. They might get to a little bit of a jog and they're scavenging for food. Some of them like human companionship. Some of them like other dogs as companionship. And some of them don't like either. 
So we also have this idea of dogs as, you know, having this, you know, when you mentioned socialization, if your dog likes other dogs, you can have play dates with other dogs. If not, you know, there's no reason for that. So it's, it's really down to the individual and looking at what they, what they like and what they want to do and then constructing something out of that. But I have also the, the sandwiching, which is a calm activity. This is usually for like reactive dogs, a calm activity. We go out, we do a little bit of maybe some, you know, setups, behavior work, and then we come home and then we do another calm activity. So we kind of set the dog up in a way that allows them to be mentally stimulated within a, you know, calmer sort of way. We then do a little bit of brain work because behavior modification is hoping to, you know, modify behavior, which is exhaustive in itself sometimes. And then we have another calming activity. So the dog can hmm, calm back down after that. Um, and then that in turn can really help to reduce behavior concerns. So if we're looking at, you know, how to fulfill those dog's needs, I describe it, which I mentioned before, as a cup. And so if your dog likes to chase squirrels, you can look at that, break that down. Okay, my dog likes to chase squirrels. What do I want my dog to do instead? Well, I want my dog to not chase squirrels. I would like my dog not to really pay attention to squirrels. What can we do to help with that? Well, if chasing is the behavior, you have the ability to play with a flirt pole and allow a constructive outlet for that behavior. And then the common question is, won't that just encourage my dog to really want to chase things and grab them and, and, you know, do those kind of behaviors that we're seeing with the squirrels? No. If you don't do that on a regular basis and supply, you know, filling that dog's cup with that activity, then yeah, your dog is going to look for that job because that's what they're telling you they want to do. So you allowing them to do that in a constructive way allows them to perform that behavior. And so you'll find that it actually reduces, along with some other techniques, it tends to reduce that behavior of wanting to chase the squirrel. So yeah. looking at enrichment from that aspect as well, it's an integral part of any behavior plan that I have for any dog that I'm working with. And I often ask, you know, clients, how much enrichment are you doing? Have you started the enrichment? We have journals for clients and I can look and, you know, they'll say this and this happened and I'm reading the report and I'm looking at what they did earlier in the day. And I'm like, he didn't have any enrichment. I'm like, oh, I didn't have time, which we all, you know, we all run into those issues, but that allows me to see a pattern. And so I can tell you that that behavior probably occurred because he didn't have anything else to do, yeah. you know? So it really can help to help resolve behaviors. I would say some behaviors, behavior has origin of lots of different, you know, mechanisms, you know, some of it is genetic and epigenetic and, you know, learned behavior. These are all kind of things that happen with, with behavior, but enrichment, not having enrichment is one of the top issues that I see, you know, with dogs who have behavior concerns is they just don't have an outlet for those things. That's really interesting. And it's funny, you mentioned, <clears throat> you know, with the the squirrels and the flirt poles, like, will this make my dog want to chase squirrels more? We get that a lot in our community of people, you know, when we, when we make lick mat, re lick mat recipes and stuff, they say, is this going to make my dog lick everything? Or if we throw food in the backyard, is this going to make my dog just search for food everywhere? And it's like, your dog already wants to do those things. So by you not providing an outlet that's appropriate in your life, they're going to do that wherever they can find it. Just like we said, Cooper probably wants to scavenge, which means he got into the trash and he's looking for stuff. Like that's exactly. And so not only can these behaviors reduce the unwanted behaviors, but they offer all the other benefits that come with enrichment as well. Now I do want to backtrack though, because you mentioned fetch. And this is one thing that Kinsey and I honestly didn't know was a problem until probably eight months ago in Cody when we were going to the, the school and throwing the ball and stuff. So please expand on the whole fetch thing and some of the misconceptions that come with that. So fetch is a high arousal game. If it's done in the more kind of traditional, so I'm thinking about a chuck it or yep. even like kicking That's a us. ball, you know, things like that. So that back and forth motion. So we'll break it down into kind of mental. So mental first is a high arousal game. We can have something where arousal is being hijacked. 
So what I mean by that is that it's harder and harder for your dog to calm down. And so when you go and play fetch with your dog and then you expect them to just come back in the house, A, they might be really tired physically, depending on how long you played and things like that. But that type of tiredness, that physical exhaustion is temporary. So we've all had it when we go to work out, you know, we get stronger, we get more endurance. And then, you know, as it kind of progresses, you might see that your dog wants to play a little longer, a little harder. They have, um, you know, a little bit of a, for lack of a better word, I would say obsession with the ball. Um, and so, you know, I've dealt with a lot of clients, mm -hmm. one specific I'm thinking of, where <laughs> the dog was so obsessed, it was Border Collie, he was so obsessed with balls. When I went for the, this was an in-person consultation, so years ago, um, that was all that they were kind of concerned of. It went on recall because he would go and chase and take other dogs' balls. Now, I can tell you, Nero, when I got him, before him, I had a, a beagle. And beautiful Elfie, she didn't want to do much but, like, cuddle and, you know, like, eat. That was that was Elfie's things. However, with Nero, when I got Nero, I was like, I really want a dog I could play fetch with. Really want to play. And I conditioned him so well that there were a couple times where he passed out from playing fetch. Um, oh. You know, he is, he had a ball obsession. And it only kind of came to a head when I was on the beach um, probably about seven, eight years ago. And he started stealing other dogs' balls. And I was like, oh, my God. Okay, now it's a problem for me, the human. I'm embarrassed. So now I have to do something about it. Um, and so this client, when I went to them, I understood completely where they were coming from, the embarrassment, um, but also the safety issue of dogs like growing across street, um, sorry, running across streets and, you know, running into other things and, you know, just ridiculous things like running into walls and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So as we're sitting there and we're discussing it, I asked the question, how intense would you say, you know, one to 10 is his ball obsession? And it was ironic because we're, we're sitting there and we're, you know, right in front of each other. And I didn't realize, but he was right next to me. And Ikea do these really big, you know, kind of paper round balls. And they had one um, kind of above where we were. And she pointed to him and she said that obsessed. And I looked at him and he was staring just standing there staring at this big ball. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So when it comes to that, and I asked them what they're doing, they played fetch every day. He's a border collie. He needs to play fetch, right? Right. So fetch can have that really mental obsession, you know, and I use obsession loosely only because, you know, it's very much kind of a, um, a human mechanism for, you know, psychology, not necessarily for dog. Um, but also that hijack of arousal system. So it makes it very difficult for the dog to, to calm down. And that's why with clients, I say we use a moderate amount of physical and then we go for a cool down cap so we can bring that arousal down. Otherwise the dog's like, you know, I'm really amped up. Um, the other thing that you can have is when the intensity is high and we'll go into more physical stuff, but dogs have, um, so do, do claws are, in place to have dogs be able to twist and turn easily. If you look at a dog when they kind of skid and stop, they will use the dew claw to turn. So it does wow. help. It does have a purpose, the dew claw. Nero, I cannot tell you how many times he ripped his dew claws. Countless amount of times. And of course, also the paw pad, paw pads, you know, and I would go, oh, my poor baby. You know, I was doing it to him. You know, he had no sense of anything. So we also have physical in injuries with that. Dew claws paw pads. Um, you can also have a lot of, depending on how it's played, skidding to a stop, you know, that kind of abrasive. So elbows, shoulder. Nero, unfortunately, has, um, he sees an osteopath and he's been diagnosed with some um, lumbar pain. And uh, one of his shoulders, he has some pain in that. And, you know, when I asked her, what, you know, telling his history and things like that, and I said, what do you think has, has caused this? Um, and she said, unfortunately, I would say it's from all of the excessive fetch that you were playing with him. And of course, I'm like. Devastated. Yeah. Could you tell me something else? <laughs> right. You know, can you make up something? Um, and yeah. So, I mean, that's part of it. I didn't realize the, the you know, the negative effects of it. Um, 
So from a mental aspect, there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, and also from a physical aspect, you know, there's a lot of things that happen within the, within the body. It's a lot of strain, especially when the dog has to kind of skid to a stop or jumping up. And that's what Nero used to do is he would, and I have pictures of it thinking like, oh my God, he's so crazy. So great. Where he's literally launched off of the ground, catching a ball and landing on his back legs and then landing on his front legs. And so I look at those pictures and uh, those <laughs> videos, like, oh, you live, you learn. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things with, with fetch that it's hard to get people to kind of understand. I've done a couple posts about fetch and I, and I will provide alternatives for people, not just saying like fetch is bad, but also saying like, this is why fetch is bad. And here's other ways that you can, you know, utilize playing with your dogs with toys and stuff. So it always gets a, a lot of, um, what's the nice way to say, uh, attention whenever yeah. I, I post about fetch. Yep, totally. We've got some research to do on R plus dogs Instagram. <laughs> so what are the alternatives? What do you recommend? Nose work. I mean, you can also train the dog to, so with lichen, I ask for tricks um, and he will do the tricks and then I'll use the fetch as a like reward for the tricks. So we're getting a few tricks in and so I'll do chains, like teaching, teaching dogs tricks are amazing. I highly recommend teaching dogs tricks. They're simple, they're easy, they're fun, they're great for bonding, but also you can build behavior chain, um, sorry, trick train, trick, trick trains. Let me say that <laughs> five times. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, say you have like 20, 25 different tricks, you can pick different ones and then ask for those. So for him, he knows about 25 different things and I'll circle through and add different things in, you know, the other day we just did bang, which is play dead. And he hadn't done that one in, oh gosh, probably a couple months. So I'm adding in things. He has to think about what I'm asking. You know, he has to think about the trick. He has to, you know, perform the trick where I would say he can perform the trick if he wants to, if he's, you know, if he doesn't want to, I'm not like, you must do it, but you know, he wants to do them. He's like, yes, yes. So that is an alternative that you can do where you can use the ball as a reward for a few different tricks and you mix up the tricks each time. The other thing that I do with Nero, who is still ball obsessed, um, thanks mom, uh, <laughs> is we will play fetch, but we will play fetch in a way that is, um, like one or two, I'll keep the ball low so he doesn't have to skid to a stop and things like that. And then for every like one or two that we play fetch, we'll play a game of find it. And mm -hmm. so then he has to, and I have a cue for him because he likes to start, he's a part sight hound and also border collie in there. So he'll use his, his you know, eyes to look for. So I've cued him, use your nose. And so he has to use his nose in order to, to find the ball. Right now our grass is a little bit long and I've asked my husband to keep like a little bit of it still long so that I can play that game with him. So it's not, you know, it's a little bit harder for him to find. So he'll spend a couple minutes just going through and trying to find the ball with his nose. And when he finds it, big cheer, yay, good boy, he brings it back to me. And then we do a couple more fetches and we'll play that for like five, 10 minutes. General nose work, you know, if you get into some classes and things like that, they're online now as well. Um, I'm trying to think about whatever else is in the post. There's like five alternatives, I think. Yeah, um, good to that... know. And Renee, I might have you send me that post. That way we can link it yeah. in the show notes for everybody to see here. So it'll definitely be down in the hmm. description. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's other ways. I mean, the beautiful thing about enrichment is that it is like – never ending. There's so many different ideas of things that you can do with enrichment and especially with toys and games and stuff with your dog. So if you come up with your own thing and people will tell me that they do come up with their own thing to, um, fetch. So like having your dog wait and going and placing the doll or hiding the ball somewhere, that's an alternative. You know, there's lots of things that you can do. I find what works yeah. for you. Totally. And like we talked about earlier, every dog is obviously an individual. So it's going to be trial and error and just seeing what works for your dog, of course. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, different methods and a lot of these ways that people can start implementing this. What are a lot of the myths surrounding enrichment? Because, you know, like we talked about, we've even shared content of us throwing the ball and like there might be even myths that we're perpetuating. So what do you see, you know, especially on social media that is a common myth with enrichment in dogs? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, 
I would say more often kind of with, with clients, um, social media, social media is a funny old one. Um, I try <laughs> not to look too much at social media, um, just cause it just, it just makes me angry. So, yeah, um, you. for my own mental health, um, but I would say with clients, the kind of common things that come up are, um, kind of like quantity over quality. So like time challenges, you know, things that's like, oh, it took my dog an hour and a half to do this activity. I'm like, if, yeah, we all have things that we enjoy and we want to do. And you're like, whoa, where did the time go? I'm having so much fun. But there's certain things I think about with dogs. Like if your dog is chewing on something for an hour and a half or your dog is licking something for like an hour and a half, how comfortable is that? So- sure. I think we often get, you know, or we want to tire the dog out and we think, oh, it needs to be this long lasting thing. Um, but I, I, I definitely think for me, I try to instill quality over quantity. If it took the dog five minutes, but the dog was really engaged in the activity, that's a better five minutes than if it took them 50 minutes and they're just on autopilot, you know, licking this thing for whatever. And then... I think, you know, when it comes to that quality over, over quantity as well, that also comes down to, we have to, like I said before, keep our dogs, you know, physically, sorry, mentally stimulated all the time. That's another misconception. So like for me, it's like two, maybe three, depending on the activity. Sometimes for me with, with my dogs, I'm lucky enough that, you know, I can let them off lead in the woods. And sometimes it will be 45 minutes in the woods with me praying that I don't see anybody else. Um, that can be really enriching for them. And we won't do anything else the rest of the day. I am a huge fan of um, chew bins, which I think I created, but chew bins are um, where the dogs have a container, which is just like a plastic container. And I put chews in it. So like about every, about every week and a half, I put about 10 to 15 different chews and it's available to them all of the time. They can go and get it whenever they want. And sometimes they will chew on something for a long period of time. Sometimes they'll chew on it for a couple of minutes. So I don't necessarily have like a time commitment when I'm looking at them performing something. And that's what I really try to instill with clients as well is that some things can be independent of you. You know, you don't have to be giving your dogs things and giving your dogs things giving them a little bit of choice. Um, I also have some pre-filled because we do a really nice um, kibble uh, in adjacent. So my dogs are raw fed, um, but we do a nice kibble that I can provide with some enrichment activities. And so there will be pre-loaded toys that are available. I think you can probably see a Kong behind me. Um, that was a pre-loaded toy before. And I will put them out in the beginning of the day. And so if the dogs are hungry, A, I have like <laughs> a whole plethora of treats just on my desk for when I need them, but also there's the chew bin and then there's preloaded toys. So they can do things independent of me and having those set up in the same places every single time, if they want to do an activity, they can, they can go and grab one themselves. I don't have to be constantly, you know, um, enriching them. And I think yeah. people do get, get caught up yeah. in that. And that's, uh, it's really interesting too. um, the whole like self selecting kind of thing. And we're learning about this, even in nutrition, you know, people offering their dogs and cats, a wide variety of different foods. And it's kind of the thinking like, you know, they'll go and eat what their body needs and stuff like that. But I like what you said is giving them a little bit more autonomy in this very sedentary and captive lifestyle that we already live. So that's a really cool method that you use. Now, I feel like, do you only have one dog or do you have two? I have two, yeah. Gotcha. Do they have any resource guarding issues with each other about, you know, toys and, and shoes left out like that? So for me, um, the dogs, whenever they have their, like, main meal, which is their raw, obviously that's that's rated much, much higher for them. So it's a higher value um, item. So they are separated when they're fed the, their dinner. When it comes to the chews, um, we do with Lycan, because he's a German Shepherd, we do have a little bit of resource guarding from him. But what he will do is it kind of looks like he might stand, like if Nero goes over to the box, he might stand there or he might go over. 
Um, and then Nero has become more confident in just picking up the juice. So he's not going to do anything. He just has this kind of, I don't know, this automatic response to go over and see like, you know, what are you doing? What are you picking yeah. up, Nero? Um, is it for me? And so <laughs> if Nero's at all feeling, Nero just, you know, he's gaining a lot of, he's 11 now. So he's like, move over, kid. Because Lycan's only like five. <laughs> but yeah, he'll just pick up the chew and, and walk somewhere. He's actually... Not to boast too much, but he's very smart. So what he's actually started doing with the uh, chew box is he will get out a chew and he will go and dump it on the floor. And then he'll go back to the box and he'll go and get something else. So my uh -huh. husband and I watching this, we're like, he's getting a chew out to distract Lycan. So Lycan will go for the chew that he just dumped out first. And then Nero can be like, -da 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 -da, back to the box <laughs> I go. And so Whoa. it's it's quite interesting to watch them. But yeah, there's a little bit and they're never left. They're not left alone. So if we leave the house, they're separated. They're never left alone unsupervised. Generally, I work in the like living room. So if they are out together, you know, I'm generally like in the vicinity. Um, so yeah, there is a there is a little bit, but it's definitely manageable. If I see that escalate or if I see any change in that, then I would definitely take steps with that. And I, you know, for multi-dog households, I never um, encourage like a chew bin open like it is in my household. I would say if you have multi, if you are a multi-dog household, you might supply like two in, in separate areas or as an alternative, um, what I like to say to clients is, you know, have a have an area where you have a few different chews. Go and grab three and individually with your dogs, you know, set down the three and say, which one do you want? And have the dog choose their chew. Um, and if, you know, whatever they take, then you pick up the other two and you you do it the next time. So there's a way around that to still give the dog more choice that allows them the opportunity to to chew more. Totally. And it's so funny. It's like you you wanted to put all this stuff out for your two dogs to self-select and now Nero's deciding what everyone gets to play with. <laughs> he's just, he's so, he's, oh, I love him so much. He's so, but he came up with this on his own. And it's like, it's so interesting to, to, you know, we don't give dogs enough credit. So yeah, I love it. that is really cool. So last thing, Renee, you know, I think a lot of people are going to find a lot of value in this episode and I want them to be able to find more information from you. So where can they find you? You know, website, social media, any places where you're at, please let them know. And, and we'll obviously drop all the links in the description as well. Yeah. So my website is um, rplusdogs.com and that's plus spelled out. Um, and then I'm available on Facebook. Um, so Facebook, I'm not as prominent on, um, but I'm definitely there. And that is R plus dogs behavior. And then Instagram, which is my, <laughs> my pretty much my primary hub. Um, it is R plus or sorry, R dot plus dot dogs. Um, I'm on TikTok loosely. I'm trying <laughs> to, um, maybe dip my toe in again in the old TikTok. Um, but I'm R plus dogs on, on there. And then I also have a podcast as well, which is called Dog Logical that I do with my um, really great friend and colleague, Cassie Dixon. Um, and we're on a little hiatus at the moment because my voice has been, as you can tell, it's a little, little gravelly, um, but we're coming back with some, some new episodes. And I just want to extend, which I think I've already extended, but I'd love to have you guys on, the, on our podcast as well. Absolutely. And we will absolutely be on there. Yes. Uh, Renee, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on today. And like I said, I think our audience will really find a lot of value in this. And we're just so thankful that you're willing to share all this information because you've worked very hard to get the information that you currently have. So and we will be having yeah. you back. <laughs> yes. Because it sounds like there are many things we could really dive into together. It's been an hour 13 and we got through maybe half of the questions. So yeah, <laughs> we'll definitely, we'll pick a new topic for next time and dive right in. But yeah, thank you again for being on. We had a great time with you today. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much course. And to everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us today. As always, we're Bryce and Kenzie of the BK Pets, and we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>